Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. If you're ready to read the word of the Lord, come on, declare by saying amen. amen. Beginning at verse 1, let's read in concert together. One, two, three, let's read. And when the day, come on, they were all, mm-hmm, come on. All the house. What I what I hear while you were reading, and uh, initially I was going to read to you and over you and declare it to you, but the Holy Spirit had me to have us read together. And what I heard while you were reading, it's very important, and I'm going to let you have your seat in a moment. It's very important that you get the picture of what you're reading in your head. That th- these who uh, decided to obey and wait to be endued with power to have this outpouring uh, happen to them as Jesus had promised, they, they were in a place but the Bible says that when the sound came, when the, the sound of a rushing mighty wind came, the Bible says that it filled. Come on. Don't get, don't get to the people first. The, 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 the people didn't give, get, get filled first. What was, what was filled first? The, the house. So the picture I want you to get is, first of all, the atmosphere. The importance of that atmosphere. And the atmosphere just wasn't important for the people to be filled because ultimately what filled the people end up now being a expression of what had filled the house and what filled the people, the expression of what filled them and what flowed through them ultimately drew others to them. But the people that were drawn to them was now just not impacted by what was flowing through them, but was also impacted. I believe the soil of their hearts was being dealt with by the spirit that was in the atmosphere, permeating the atmosphere. So that the time that the Holy Spirit ministered through the 120, through the spoken words, their hearts were prepared to receive, even though they reject and mocked immediately, eventually. Eventually, 3,000 of them received it. But 3,000 received it, not just because of what filled the people, but also what filled the house. And so it's important that you get that picture. The house got to be right because the house impacts the people. Now, don't, don't get deep on me because we don't want to argue the Bible this morning about your, your body is the temple. Oh, now you want to talk about your body being the temple of the Holy Ghost at the end of the day. But the temple where the body gathers, where the people come corporately, the atmosphere in this corporate temple is just as important for those of us that are coming into the temple to have this temple refreshed so that this temple can go out into that darkness and shed the light. Okay, be seated, be seated. Let's talk about it then. The Bible says that, put, put my uh, scripture back up there for me, Brother James. The Bible says that things happen on the day of Pentecost and the house was filled. And I like the, the language that the Bible uh, was using. Let's go back to verse one. The, the language that the Bible was using and it talked in plurality. And I believe that in certain instances, and I think that sometimes we limit God when we make God, when we take God and turn him into black and white. As if to say, if I read one thing in scripture, that it can only be this one principle that is uh, derived from that particular principle. But I believe that in in instances, you can read one principle and that that one principle read can be presented to you in different formats based upon the season that you're walking in and still not compromise the truth of that scripture. What do you mean by that? 
If, if you've been walking with the Lord for any amount of time and you've studied the word of God, the lessons that you studied in Sunday school as a kid have different meaning to you now as an adult. Because the application for you as an adult is not the same for you as when you were a child. It's the same scripture having the same meaning in the same context, but the application at this age in your life is different because of the season that you're in. There's great revelations in the seasons that you're in as you walk in them, so don't paint God black and white. I believe that sometimes people can come into the house of God with no intention of being filled and still get filled. Why? Because of what happens in the atmosphere. Yes. These same people, the 3,000 that got saved, ultimately started out laughing at them, calling them drunk. But before you know it, the same thing that said that they were laughing yet became the same thing that they became overpowered by or overshadowed by or ultimately succumbed to. And so it's so important that you understand that in order for us to be able to really function at certain season and at certain levels that, that, that when we come together, there's got to be something going on in the atmosphere. Look at somebody and tell them the atmosphere matters. And y'all a trip, y'all a trip because we understand the atmosphere when it, when it talks about growing stuff, when it talks about outfits and fashion, but when we talk about spiritual matters, everybody seems to be confused about it. The atmosphere is important when you decide what you're going to put on. I don't see nobody up in here today with no flip-flops, tank tops, and shorts because the outside atmosphere suggests it's a little chilly out there. And because of the atmosphere out there, though you might have laid it out last night, when you got up and felt the temperature, you made adjustment. Y'all ain't saying nothing up in here. And then you can come into an atmosphere and sense that something is not there or something is there. And then if it's not where it need to be, you still got on the same outfit and not willing to make any adjustments to bring the atmosphere where it needs to be to match your expectation. He said, because many of us settle for being uh, thermometers when he's giving you the power to be the thermostat. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when I, um, <laughs> when they texted me this week and asked me what direction I was going in this week, and I said to them, well, I ain't going to tell you what I said to them, what I... <laughs> What I did share with them was I kept hearing this question. Because see, last Sunday, we, we were on fire. Oh, last Sunday, we had that white on. We were twirling around in the... We had this glow. You had your halo. You had your fire. You had your oil. And seven days later, oh, last week your expectation was here. Oh, I'm hungry and I'm thirsty for God. And you got filled last week. And this week you're not thirsty anymore. This week we're not hungry anymore. This week we'll take what we can get. This week we'll show up at church and sit on the pew and fall asleep and we'll sit on the pew and be like, they better be glad I showed up and at the end get out in the world and wonder why the devil has the ability to do what he's doing in your life and then be mad at God because you can't overcome it. Yeah, last week we celebrated Pentecost. We had on white, white socks and white uh, bottoms and white tops and everybody, it was like kids at Christmas. But now that the moment has come and gone, the date on the calendar has come and gone, look at your neighbor, because I'm, I'm upsetting some people, so look at them and just ask them, now what? Come on, look at them like you're really interested in finding out their response to it. Look them in the eye. Matter of fact, you need to grab them by the hand and ask them, neighbor, now what? Because you got the Holy Ghost and the mighty burning fire. Oh, we had us a good revival. Oh, last week the Lord ministered to me. But seven days have come and gone. And he ain't said nothing to you since last Sunday? Hmm, interesting. 
We celebrated the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as spoken by Joel the prophet. We celebrated the promise uh, being fulfilled that Jesus gave them when he told them in Luke 24, 49, I believe it was, to go to Jerusalem and they were to wait there until uh, Luke records the word endued, endued with power, to, to wait until they receive something before they do something. And that was important to me even before I go any further because you have to understand, you can't do his stuff and not have his power. And his power is more than just the momentary elements of last Sunday's Pentecost. Because after we get through dancing and after we get through shouting, there's work to be done. But in order for, for us to be able to be successful at doing his work, we need to have his power because his power is going to help us to deal with the people that we're serving while we're doing his work. Because the people that we serve won't be like us. They won't look like us. They probably won't believe like us. Because again, the initial crowd that encountered the first 120 to receive it didn't look like them. They were different nationalities. They didn't even act like them. That's why they were laughing at them. Only for 3,000 of them to become them. Lord, yeah. So, so at, at the end, Jesus' promise to them is fulfilled and they have received the power. But what did we get power for? What did he fill you for? So we can come back today and look at me like you're looking at me now. But we got the Holy Ghost. Why, why did he give us power? Does the power really have purpose? Or are we the body of Christ even interested in why we got it? And see, we, we, can't, we, we cannot afford to be interested in having power with the intent of proving points to people who got the same power. It's got to be more than me just wanting BB to know I got power too. I hear from the Lord too. I, I can speak in tongue too. But then you go out here and your behavior don't match your So it's got to be more than me trying to prove a, look at somebody and tell them I'm not even trying to prove a point with you this morning. So, so when we began to um, go further with this question that just kept ringing, I tried very hard to go in a different direction. I'd even had a sermon, another sermon I was going to preach, and I even was like, okay, it's Father's Day, and I need to be able to encourage the brothers. Hey, brothers, be encouraged. Power to you. But I couldn't get away from Acts chapter 2 because one of the things I want in particular for our local ministry, for our local church that ultimately impacts our diocese is for us to be the church in Acts. And I did not say the church of Acts. I want us to be the church that was in Acts. So I wanted to spend more time today, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be deep, I'm not trying to be uh, hard, I'm not trying to be, uh, um, well, I am trying to challenge you, so I can't say that. M my goal today is to get you to look at what you've overlooked so you can see how profound it is and how purposeful it is if we're going to be the church in Acts. So my goal for, uh, for us today is to go back to Acts chapter 2. And to continue in our discussion, and in our discussion, and our study rather, of the outpouring, and what was the intention of God giving us his spirit? We got to rediscover, for some it's a, it's a rediscovery, for others it will be your first time discovering it. We need to rediscover, or we, we need to discover the purpose that the Holy Spirit came, and what impact should he have now that he's here? He's arrived. He is here. Yeah. Yeah. He's not just living in me, but he is in this atmosphere. He, he's permeated this atmosphere, and he is present with us and in the midst of us. But when he arrived, when he came, he came to benefit the receiver and everything that is connected to the receiver. He told me this, you can't receive me and nobody that is connected to you be impacted by me 
and then still say, I'm living in you. Uh, okay, maybe I said that wrong. I can't endow you with something, give you something, and then the people connected to you are not blessed by, benefited by, exposed to what I have done in you. Because though you have the opportunity to choose, when I, when I come, there's a willingness from you that ultimately enables me to flow through you. Does that make sense? So it's important for us to understand that beloved Pentecost has to be more than emotion, emotional ecstasy. We manifested the emotional goosebumps of Pentecost. Last week we had the sound and the tongues and we had the crying and the walking and the hand waving. But after that, now what? Oh, I got it. It ain't no, I'm not, I'm not debating. And I'm not saying you don't have it or do have it. I'm just saying if he's there, now what? Because I found out something. Uh, that Christians, Christians, it's possible for Christians to worship God with what looks like on the outside to be this deep intimacy. Oh, on Sundays, we are deeper than the blue ocean. But after the depth of our intimacy that we put on in worship on Sunday, the behavior that we have is unchristian in the workplace on Monday. And, 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 and uh, as a pastor, I'm saying, God, I don't want to spend 20 more years of my life. And we just going through Sunday jazzercise or Sunday, let me get my hit. Or Sunday, I want to feel good, but I don't want to live right. If that's all that he came for, we don't need to do all the rest of this stuff. And then he began to talk to me, and he says, that's not the problem. The problem is, that's the easy part of the relationship with me. Most people, most Christians, especially the contemporary Christian community, do not want to invest in the hard work of pursuing what it is to transform your mind to be a Christian so that your behavior is that of, uh, y'all don't want to say that. See, it's easy to do this. If, if I practice at home enough, I may don't have it just like this, but I can get something quite close to it. Oh, I can practice enough until you're convinced that I got something. Might not be the Holy Spirit, but uh, he got some, oh, give them some crocodile tears. They, they can't be not, not for real. They can't be faking. And all them tears rolling and all that, and you do know some fire is strange. That's why you got to be spiritual so you know the difference between his fire and strange fire. And notice the word I used. I said Christians, not sinners. Because now I understand what Paul meant when he kept talking about them folk at Corinth. Them folk at Corinth weren't unbelievers, y'all. Paul's letter wasn't to the lost. Look at this church looking at me like they looking. Paul's letters, his epistles in the New Testament was to the church. And one of the things that Paul continually and consistently had to address the church at Corinth on was their carnality. Not their Christianity and not how much they know God and how deep they are and what their titles are. He had to deal with them about their carnality. So it is possible to be a Christian but still be carnal. And so, 
My question for us, and the question was for me as well. Because if you just want to feel good, and you just want a goose bump, and you just want the ability to talk in tongues, but don't want to be able to ultimately be the salt and the light, then you've missed the whole reason for him coming and abiding in us. You've got to commit to the hard work. I'm not going to get no help because preaching to y'all this morning seemed to be hard work. Grab somebody by the hand and tell them, you got to commit to the hard work. And Christians are a trip. Okay, watch this. How many of y'all got membership to a health club? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I ain't gonna ask how many go. I just wanna know fourteen. How many you got membership? For those that go to get the results of what you see this morning, <laughs> what's funny? Oh, to look like this, you you got to put the work in. <laughs> you you don't get this kind of body just. You got to eat cupcakes for this. You, you got to eat you some chicken, some church chicken. No, back to what I'm saying. You got to put the work in. One of the things my brother, Pastor uh, Kerry Connor out of Vegas, he in that club every day. He probably at that club more than he go to church. I'm sorry, bro. Yeah. But it's the discipline of going that gives him the fulfillment because he sees the fruit of his labor. We will commit to health club. We commit to workouts, eating regiments, saving regiments, but no Christian regiments. We, we are lacking because we don't want to do the hard work. The disciplines of being a disciple. And so he wanted us to talk about (laughs) what's next. So that how we behave matches what we talk about. How we live matches how we shout. See, one of the reasons why this generation ain't impressed with Jesus is because how many of us in the generations in front of them lived our lives. And I know you ain't gonna like it, but I got the mic and ain't nothing you can do about it. We, we come to church and we do all this stuff in church and we say all this stuff in church and then get home and all, your child is acting out what they hear and see. Yeah, okay, just, let's just go on. So to be filled with the spirit, it has to mean more to us than just a good shout. <laughs> you gotta have more than a dope dance. I don't care how you can put, pick them up. And I mean, I see some folk, it'd be like, they'd be gliding on. It's like, I was like, they, in their day, they had to be a stepper because they just, they do that holy thing too. I'm, I'm like, pretty dance, but a pitiful life. I'd rather have a powerful life and no dance. Because it's going to be my life that get me in. and not my, y'all, y'all don't want to talk to me today, yeah. So, so to be filled with the Spirit, got to be more than a dope dance. It got to be more than just us coming to church on Sundays and having a feel-good time. Now, I don't want you to get it twisted. All those things are part of being saved. God don't mind us coming into his house and celebrating the Bible talks. That that's how we should do it. But after that happens, something else should be going on. Will you help your neighbor to stay with me and push him and tell him something else got to happen? Come on, look at them and tell the neighbor, something else got to happen. And that's what I want to stress to you for these few moments that we have together this morning. Before Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit's work had been done from without. Oftentimes through the old, old Mosaic Covenant in the Old Testament, when you hear of the Spirit of the Lord manifesting, it came upon them. The Spirit of the Lord came upon them in the Old Testament. Now, after the Pentecost experience, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them with the intent now to fill them. Notice how even in the depiction of the day of Pentecost, 
the spirit appears as a cloven tongue. Okay, I don't want to start that argument. The, the, the Holy Spirit appeared. Something can appear to be something and it not really be what it is. Appeared as cloven tongue as of fire. Came up on them, set up upon them. Then left from being on them. Because some of us, we get them on us. Oh my goodness, we get, we get them like makeup transfers to my wife last week when I left before I could get it on good. One of y'all put y'all makeup on it. The Holy Spirit can get on you like that. What, what do you mean? You can come into an atmosphere that is charged with his presence and charged with his power and you can really feel the power and presence of God. And the Holy Spirit not be residing. So, so I want you to understand, Holy Spirit needs to be more than just on you. Because if I had on the right shirt, I'll show you the picture of how when it's on you, if it's on me, I can take it off. It's, it's, it's real easy to take something off you that's on you. But now when something gets so, so the Holy Spirit is no longer now coming up on them in the way that he did in the Old Testament. Now he says, I don't want to stop by. I want to stay. <laughs> oh, Lord, I'm about to mess him up. Y'all remember old, old King Saul? Y'all know Saul was a wicked king at the end of his... He was wicked because he disobeyed God. Let me not say wicked. He was disobedient to God. That's what cost him, cost him his seat. Because God told him to do something. He didn't do it and then lied. Tried to cover up what he didn't do. Remember that? Well, you do remember a text. Uh, I want to say it somewhere in Samuel. Uh, Pastor Billingsley is our Christian air director, so she'll have it for you. You can see her after church, and she'll tell you exactly where it is in the Bible, where uh, Saul ended up prophesying. Saul ended up doing what Samuel did. But you know why? Because the spirit came up. <laughs> Maybe if the spirit was living in him, he would have destroyed all of it like he's supposed to. What, what's my point? That a lot of times we settle for it being on us and not really thirst for him living. He, he no longer wants to stop by. Come by here, Lord. Come by here. Why we want to manifest presence in the corporate setting, it's got to be more than just a ride by. He wants to reside. So the Holy Spirit comes, appears unto them as fire, cloven tongues of fire, sets upon them. And then the Bible says, verse 4 is where we're going to draw three things from and I'm going to be done. Verse 4, go to verse 4. And let's just, let's just dig there. Verse four. One, two, ready, read it. What's happening here, beloved, is verses one through three is really like the backdrop to verse four. The real action of Pentecost is in verse four. Everything else was leading them into that moment. This is now um, a, a coming out party for the church. The church now is being acknowledged by God as his holy people and his holy temple. And now he wants to fill his temple. You do know, I believe it's 1 Corinthians either 19 and 16 or 16 and 19 that talks about, don't you know your body is the temple of who? Of the Holy Ghost. And so you need to treat your body like it's not your body because somebody paid for your body so that they can live in your body. Know ye 
not that your body ain't yoked. So I can't just do what I, oh, we were, uh, there's a Bible app that my wife and I use called Abide. And the other day, one of the meditation scriptures was talking about our temple. We don't understand that what happens to this temple affects what happens when we come into this temple. And I'm not talking about even the disciplines of reading your Bible, the disciplines of prayer, the disciplines of fasting. I'm talking about the discipline of rest. Okay. So they all were in the house and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to as the verse 4 says they were filled with the Holy Spirit they began to speak with tongues of the tongues as the Spirit gave utterance three things I see in there that we need to see now number one write it down Expression in speech. Expression in speech. What you say should match what you prof profess that has happened internally. Expression in speech. Number two, supernatural ability. Everybody say supernatural ability. <laughs> Expression in speech is number one. Supernatural ability is number two. And the third thing I saw in there was the source of the supernatural so that we don't get it twisted and start thinking it's what you do and what you control and what you conjure up. No, it's not me. It's not you, but there's a source to this thing we call the supernatural. So let's look at the first thing. The Bible says they were all filled. What was the first act that they did after they were filled? Speak, right? Now, in order for me to speak, talking is an expression. So there was an action after there was a feeling. There was an expression. What, what am I making a big deal about this for? Because those who were filled became those who spoke. And this is important because what they said became the bait that drew others to them. The people that were drawn, that mocked them, and then later became like them, were drawn not just because the sound of a, a rushing mighty wind, but also because the sound of the language that was being spoken by the the expression drew people. Okay, we have given up the expression of being who we are. Other cultures have adopted it, and we've become reserved. Oh, it don't take all that now. You mean I got to do all that? You might not do what I do, but you ought to be doing. Lord, Lord this old dead church, do anybody know the 107th Psalm, verse number two, that said, let, let, let the, let the, let the, let the, let the let, let the redeemed of the Lord, not the lost, not the people who have not been filled, but the redeemed of the Lord ought to be expressing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Why? Because we have something to talk about. Who has been redeemed from the hand of, if you don't have nothing else to talk about, you got your story. If I don't know another Bible verse, if I don't know how the theology of a thing, if I don't know the doctrine of a thing, I know what I experienced, I know what God saved me from, I know what God forgave me from, and if I can't talk about nothing else, I can tell my story. But the problem is you don't want nobody to know your past. But the power of your past is going to be what breaks captives free in your present. Because others are struggling with what you just got saved from. And when they hear your real testimony. So I'll be telling people, don't, I'm not ashamed to tell people. My wife ain't the first woman I slept with. She the only one I've been married to. But she ain't the first one I, and yours ain't the first one you slept with. Don't be sitting up here talking about I kept myself. You lying. I would go to church, junior deacon, choir, 
But if they had saw me 24 to 48 hours earlier, is that the junior deacon? Oh, I, I, I was more than just a handful. And you can't be afraid or sick. Do you know that's what make God look good? You, you so worried about looking good and God wants to look good because it makes him look good when he can know all that stuff you did, forgive you of it, and then use you the way he uses you. Who would ever thought this crown royal drinking, reefer smoking, y'all don't want to say nothing up in here. I ain't the only one drinking it. Do me a favor so I can set the whole church free. On your right and left, just tell them your drink of choice. Oh, I, I, I don't drink, Reverend. Bishop, I've never drank. Well, tell them something you used to do you ain't doing no more with your deep self. What's your testimony? What are you saying? Anybody, anybody that went out with me already knew my drink of choice. And I ain't have time to drink like you weak drinkers where you got to have something mixed with it. I want all the liquor. Don't put nothing in it. If I got to have something, let me chase the liquor down. But I want it straight. Where my straight drinkers at up in here? Lord, this old deep church, I'm trying to set you free. You put nothing in my drink. So when you hear that and you see this, that makes him look good. Listen, no amount of study, no amount of paperwork, no degree can bring you to this point to function at this level. It's got to be the hand of God, baby. I wish I honest church. I need about eight of y'all to help me so I won't be out here by myself to go high five somebody and tell them I'm a living testimony. It's got to be a real loving, forgiving God to be able to let me do what I did and now allow me to do what I'm doing. Lord, Zeph, I wish they'd come on and wake up. God's got to be forgiven. God's got to be merciful. God's got to be kind. God's got to be long-suffering to let me do what I did and then anoint me to do what I'm doing. Why is that important? Because somebody else that is out there now doing what I did need to know it's not too late. You can do something else. Glory to God. Look at somebody and tell them you can do something else. My expression and speech is important because it can connect to somebody. Okay. Have you ever been doing something and felt like you just can't help it? I guess this is just how I am. The honest section. We'll deal with the lying people later. Honest people, raise your hand. You, you, you've been doing something and you just thought at the end, I just can't help it. Because you thought that this was the way. And then you met Jesus. I said, and then you met Jesus. Who said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. And you found out you didn't have to do that. You could do something better. So somebody else who's doing what you did need to know they can do something else other than what they're doing. I'll never be ashamed of my testimony. High five your deep neighbor and tell them, and don't you be ashamed of yours either. What makes God great is his ability to know all your deepest, darkest secrets. Okay. See, y'all gonna make me go there now. God knows the worst about you. See, this section, y'all really go. Y'all gonna make me come and walk amongst them in a minute. God knows the worst. Maybe if I come down there, you'll... I said, God knows the worst about you. 
God knows what you're thinking right now, and it ain't God. God knows the private thoughts. God knows the private discussions. And guess what? And God loves you anyway. And how do I know that? Because even though you had the thoughts you had, had the discussion you had, he still woke you up this morning. He could have woke you up and took your ability to speak away. That's one part of it. So he knows your dirty laundry. And he knows it's the truth. <laughs> How about your neighbor tell me he know they ain't lying on you? Look at somebody else tell me he know that ain't a rumor, that's the truth. That's the God in heaven. Truth. But you won't speak to me because of what you heard about me. God know all your junk and still blesses you. You hear a rumor about your bishop. Oh, I I can't go to that church no more. What if God said, well, I can't come to your temple no more. This church don't like me no more. So, so at the end, it's important that, that the Bible says, where was I at? The Bible says, first thing that happens was their expression in speech. The power of their expression wasn't a, hey! Their first expression wasn't a, glory! Hey, hey, Mike, wasn't nobody up there talking about, shift, Mike, Mike! That's inside for those of y'all that ain't part of Rhema. No, that wasn't their first expression. Because see, most of us are consumed with that expression. And guess what? We got that. We got that. But it's that other expression that keep getting us in trouble. It's them other tongues you talk in. Ain't nobody going to say nothing to me up in this church, Clarence. And I'm trying to get to the third point. So, if their first expression was speech, then to me it suggests that there is some importance to what comes out of our mouth. We want to impress people with our language in here. But you need to let that same power help your language out there. <laughs> Look at your neighbor because they look the other way now and just ask them, what you be talking like when you're not here? Come on, don't correct me. Use the same grammar I use. Look at that neighbor and tell them, what your language be sounding like when you're talking here? What's your conversation? You know, when you're on the telephone, are you still he no 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 You know the Lord is good and up. What does what does your speech? Because spirit-filled people talk a certain kind of way. Now, now, now let's not be super deep. Talking about uh, uh, how you doing? Well, I'm blessing the Lord. I'm blessed and hot. First of all, stop yelling at me. It's okay for you to be filled with the Spirit and just tell me I'm fine. And you can still be just as deep. So I'm not talking about being where everything come out your mouth is God, Jesus, hallelujah, bless the Lord, the Lord is good. Because while all those things are true, you don't feel that all the time. Where is this honest shifting section in this church? You don't feel hallelujah all the time. That's why when Pastor Jay was up here this morning trying to get you to join her choir, you were like, okay, that's good. Yeah, that's good. So don't sit here and act like you just float on the clouds all the time and it's just you and Jesus. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about being spirit-filled. Because to do that, it takes work. You don't get to access the presence of God just because you woke up. Okay, so so 
Uh, let's get back to our notes. Uh, first thing that happens is the expression of what they say. This is important because them speaking drew them that were looking. It drew the attention of those who gathered and those who gathered became the audience for Peter to preach to. Oh, Jesus. I hear you. So, at least 3,000 people were not there initially. Because the Bible says, I believe it's verse 5, that talks about how the people came to them. When, the, when it was noised abroad, I believe is the language that, that the Bible uses, people came. So, what I just heard him say, Lady B, ask them, who did Peter preach to? The tongue talkers or the people that were drew by the tongue talkers? Where did the audience come from? How, 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 how did Peter have enough people to preach to that 3,000 people joined church? And we content with me preaching to tongue talkers every week. See this deep church. So. The audience of unbelievers who needed to be saved was drawn by the tongue talking people who gathered in the temple every Sunday. Who are you drawing? Who's in the seats today because of you? Y'all, now y'all, y'all won't even look. Y'all, you didn't close your Bible. You didn't turn your phone off. Yeah, preach, preach, Bishop. Who, who's in the, who's in Rhema today? Let me just talk to Rhema. Who's in here today that need to hear because of what's happening within you? Peter had an audience because what was happening in that body. And we've been gathering for a while now. Is anybody being drawn? Or maybe they don't feel comfortable when, oh, okay, that's, that's, okay. So, so, okay. Um, Bible says, let me get back to my notes. I just heard that and I was going to share with y'all. So, uh, that wasn't in my notes. So, let's go back up here. He says, Peter preaches to the people who were gathered, but the people who were gathered were gathered because of the tongues that were being spoken, the language, the sound of the language. Now, what, I, what I'm not suggesting to you is that everybody in here got to be talking in tongues in order to draw people. That's not what I'm saying, because it was the sound. And you've been hearing me talk about this, that the, the, the importance of the sound, what was happening with the people is what drew other people to them so that Jesus could be presented to the people that were gathered. What you're doing will either draw them to him or drive them away from him. Some people don't want Jesus, not because of me, but because of you. Oh, this church, I done made them mad now, yeah. Some people are rejecting Jesus, not because them are other Christians. They don't even know them. They know you. They work with you. They live on your block. They live in your house. Because they figure we doing the same stuff. So why do I need to take time from my schedule and do all that extra stuff if we're doing the same stuff? So, may, okay, yeah, so anyway, um, Peter, Peter begins preaching. Something is happening through them, not by them, but what's happening through them raises the curiosity of strangers who never knew them. And now these strangers are going to be presenting the word of God. Let's go to the next point. Number one, we said that the first thing that happens when a person is filled or when they were filled, let's just keep it that way. When they were filled was what? Expression in? What was the second thing? Now to understand that, make sure all the mics are closed. To understand that, it's important that you look a little further because they wasn't babbling. And it was in their speaking that the supernatural is manifested. The Bible says that they did what? Go back to verse four. The Bible says they did what? 
I said, go back to verse four. And then I asked you, the Bible said they did what? <laughs> Y'all are too funny this morning. After they were filled, they began to begin to speak with, underline that part, because that's where the supernatural manifests. Nobody took a Greco-Roman class. Nobody took a, a, a class in the languages of that day because they weren't in the upper room for that. They were there to receive power. When the power fell upon them, it enabled them to do something they didn't study. Something nobody taught them, but because of who was in them, the way he was manifesting himself to others was to say, I'm going to show them in an undeniable way that I've come upon them. Now, in this particular text, I believe that the sign was for both believers and unbelievers. There are other instances where I believe that the Holy Spirit's manifestation and the gifts of the Spirit are for unbelievers. Because believers should need convincing. Believers shouldn't be shocked when people get healed. That should be our normal. So the gift of healing should be something we see. So those, those when you talk about those kind of gifts, it's, it's you know, th those. But in this text, I believe it was beneficial for both believer and because now you got to understand the significance of the time. The church is being birthed. So they had to have a conviction about what it was that they were going to carry. The mandate and the message and the mission that they were about to go upon. They had to have a conviction that only could come through the endowment and through the empowering of Holy Spirit. If they were going to be able in the face of opposition, in the face of rejection, in the face of mockery to declare the message of Jesus Christ. But also for the people who were onlookers, they had to be convinced and it had to be undeniable for them that at the end, this had to be something beyond their ability to do. Because in the text, I believe it's verse number seven. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Verse number seven of the same text, it refers to the onlookers saying that these are Galileans. When I, when I was studying that, <laughs> Lady B, that one tripped me out too, because I'm like, how did they know who they were? For them to say that they are Galileans. One, one writer suggests they knew by the clothes. Hmm. Uh, okay, leave that alone. Okay. Maybe they knew by the clothes that Galileans wear that these was Galileans. I'm just saying that they knew they were Galileans. And another writer said, he knew because of what the Galileans had on. They looked at what they wore and deduced from that, oh, they're Galileans. I want to say it so bad, it's right there on my tongue. Don't, don't say it, don't do it. What they call you when they see you? What, what, what do they say? Now, please understand me. By no means am I suggesting that your clothes save you. I'm not suggesting that your clothes is a factor in whether or not you can or re cannot receive the Holy Spirit. What I am saying, though, is for those who have received we're cognizant of how we present ourselves. And that's all I'm going to say. So, so, so the, the unbelievers were able to know that this wasn't something that they had the ability to do. So it had to be something else. Now they start saying it was liquor. Peter had to tell them the, the liquor store ain't open. It's too early in the morning. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Ain't no liquor store. What time y'all liquor store open? Don't nobody know? What time? It's open already? <laughs> Some of y'all got y'all stuff last night, so it don't matter whether it's open now or not. 
uh, yeah, verse, verse four says that um, they began to speak with. I like the language that King James Version used because they speak with. Okay. BB, walk. Come, walk, daughter. Walk. Whatever direction you want to walk in. Walk. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say model. BB, model. Not. She, she, she's swinging out. Y'all saw that? Y'all saw that? She, she walking like she on the runway. Now, now I'm going to walk with Nah, I said something so she didn't change the whole walk. <laughs> Initially, when BB was walking, it was her by herself. But when I walk with her, it's more than just her. Though she had a swag on her own. <laughs> I give her that. But when I came alongside her, <laughs> okay. When, when, when I walk alongside this one here, it, 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 it gives her new credit. She, she, they be looking at her like, man, she's so blessed. Mike, say amen over there. Say amen over there. They, they be looking at Lady B like, oh, man, she's so blessed. Huh? <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble on Father's Day. Same, same applies. Same applies. When, when, when they see my wife, it's like, you know, hey, I'm blessed. Because of who walks. Having somebody to walk with you. It, is there a scripture to talk about two are better than, what is it, three or what is it? Yeah, something like that. BB going, all them scriptures I'm blabbing out, she'll get all of them for you. You can ask her and she'll tell you exactly where they are in the Bible. So they spake with, I got to finish up. They spake with other tongues as the Spirit gave. They could not do what the Holy Spirit didn't empower them to do. But what they did was done by the ability of the Holy Spirit who was residing in them. The disciples were supernaturally witnessing and preaching in a language they had never studied. That's why the onlookers who were around were saying, these men are Galileans, but we hear them preaching or we hear them speaking. They didn't say preaching. We hear them speaking to us in our native tongue. I know I look Puerto Rican. But I can't speak Spanish. What's another uh, nationality I look like? Mexican? And she said it. I'll just use her illustration. Only language I know is English. So if, if anyone hears another dialect, it would have to be supernatural. So now God makes it undeniable to the hearer that it's him. Because they know the people talking it don't come from their native place. So it's got to be something more than just that person's ability. It's got to be something more than that. And when they found out it wasn't wine, I believe that's why the 3,000 got interested. Here's my second point about the supernatural ability. Because I don't think we count on the spirit like we should. Here's my second thing about this. And then I'm going to move to the last point and we're going to be done. I'm going to let you go. Peter is also proof that when the Holy Spirit fills you, he enables you to do things you once failed at. Jesus. Last time we saw Apostle Peter, Peter was cussing. Peter was telling them, folk, I don't know him. I ain't never met him. And the more they told him, he knew him the more upset he got. By the third time he lied and said he didn't know him, he started speaking in a new tongue that was prior to this tongue. He denied it, fulfilled the words that Jesus had already told him, and know he did it because the Bible says he wept bitterly. He couldn't own his Lord and Savior at the most important time. 
Oh, Lord, we don't need your shout after you got the promotion. Even though we're going to shout with you because you got it. But we want to see you shout before you get it while you believe in God for it and it ain't happened yet. But Peter failed. When Jesus needed somebody to say something for him, Peter failed. But now, Holy Spirit comes. And the same Peter who wouldn't own him in Luke, I think it's Luke uh, 26, maybe 24, 56 to 62, somewhere in there, just see BB, she'll get it to you. And he denied him. But now, guess who preaching the first sermon on Pentecost? And Peter preaching so boldly, 3,000 people join church. The denier becomes the proclaimer. What he failed at prior to Pentecost, now he becomes successful at because of Pentecost. So areas where you have failed at, when you get filled, that's why when Jesus be telling you, go back and do it again. You got something now you didn't have before you did it. And now what's in you now going to enable you to do what you failed that early. Here's my last thing. Here's my last thing. Number one, expression in. Number two, here's my last thing and we close. The source of the supernatural is so important that we understand that Pentecost is not wrapped up in individual people. The power of the Holy Spirit won't flow no stronger or no less based upon personalities. What I mean by that, because we've become entertainment, celebrity driven, personality driven. We don't feel God unless we're in the mic. How many of y'all came up in church? All, all, all of us that came up in church, some of you in here from our New Mount Vernon days. I need my New Mount Vernon crew to uh, raise your hand. When we used to go to church, to another church, we had this pride about us. Especially if the choir was going to sing. Give me a chair right here, real quick. Give me, give me a chair right here. I'm going to demonstrate this last piece, and then I might be finished. I might not. I'm going to cut it off, though. I'm going to cut it off. This was us while, while the, we in somebody else's church. They choir singing, singing good. We'll have an A and B selection now from Raymond Word Church Choir. Vernon, but you know what I'm talking about because your church did it too. Like you done brought the spirit with you. It wasn't none in there for you got there. Look at somebody and tell them that ain't nothing but flesh. You are not the source. You're the conduit. Is that the right term, Irene? Conduit? You're, you're the person the source works through. And then what you got to understand, the source is never hard up. He got a lot of folk to choose from to work through if he want to work. The source of the supernatural must what we be, what, what we must once again become dependent upon. We have depended upon people for what we should be depending upon the source for. People are limited. I can only do so much. I can't be everywhere at the same time. That's why you got to trust God so that when God sends you what you need through somebody else, you're not mad because Bishop didn't bring it. Hey, answer this for me. Is it what you ask God for? I'm sorry. Is it what you ask the Lord for? So why are you mad about who brought it? Does it, does it really matter who brought it if that's what you've been asking? 
The source ain't the preacher. The source ain't the singer, ain't the musicians, ain't the dancers. The source is not you. We are just conduits. And so when we get back to depending on him, more than we depend on ourselves, more than we depend on others, from the very beginning, the ministry of the Holy Spirit has always been important. And it must be important now. They spoke with because of. Okay. They spoke with as. Put that scripture up there because they looking at me like I'm cussing or just, and I'm going to close this and I ain't going to do no more about that. Put that scripture back up there. And they began to speak with as. I know what it said. I'm just saying it to y'all. They spoke with ass. They couldn't speak. <laughs> Almost messed that thing right up there. Until the Holy Spirit. You're trying to get ahead of him. You're trying to do it without him. You're trying to do it before them because you're trying to prove it to them. But when you get back to depending upon him, because it was his idea in the first place. The only reason I was born because he had an idea. I'm God's idea. You God's idea. God had an idea. And this is what one of his ideas looked like me. That's a pretty good idea. God had an idea that looked like you. That's a pretty good idea. You're only here because God had a, a, an intention to get something done, do something. So now how do you think you get to change your plan and do what you want and then want him to bless it? They did what they did because of the Holy Spirit's empowerment. And maybe that's why it's a struggle. My challenge for you today, and uh, we, we might... Drop it with the uh, small groups and you can discuss it in your small groups. Are we really depending on the Holy Spirit? How much of this is me and how much of this is God? That's what I want you to ponder. Whether it's my decision making, whether it's my behavior, whether it's my conversations, how much of it is me? How much of it is God? Because if Pentecost just was going to be about our white and our shout, we already missed it. We're going to go a little further. Oh, we're going to stay in this book of Acts. Yeah, it's a whole lot more in Acts because, see, after they receive, what was next was evangelistic ministry. Because that's what he told them in Acts 1-8, you're going to be my witnesses. So Paul, Peter rather, start preaching, witnessing. 3,000 souls are added. And then the next leg of we're going to talk about is that those people that got added became the community of believers. How you going to get saved and you don't want to be bothered with nobody? You get saved, you get adopted into the family. That, that, that's like me saying, I'm a bracket. And uh, uh, it's, it's a lot of us. But because uh, Martin got brown eyes, real brown, light brown eyes, and I got dark brown eyes, I'm mad because I don't have his eyes, so I don't want to be a bracket no more. I'm going to change my name. You can change your name, but you can't change your DNA. I'm still going to have the, the bracket DNA. How you going to get saved? Filled with the Holy Ghost, mighty burning fire, but you're not a member of the community of faith. And we'll talk about that in the days to come. It's really going to bless you. I don't even know what it is yet, but I know it's going to bless you. Bow your head and close your eyes if you're still able to do that. Let's get ready to go. Bow your head and close your eyes. Father, I pray now in Jesus' name that Holy Spirit, what you revealed to us, I thank you. And I pray now that it causes all of us to ponder where none of us feel more highly of ourselves or think more highly of ourselves than what we are that we all will go home and see ourselves in the light that you see us in and make the adjustments make the corrections 
that need be made. Our desire really is to not just love you, but we want to live for you. So we're grateful for the conversation you've had with us today. Now for that conversation, I pray that it marinates in the spirits of those who've received